But as we get nearer to Christmas, you've probably noticed that there's a lot of gold about um, in the shop windows. So it is only apt that tonight's lecture is also about gold. Uh, Tessa Matching is an independent archaeologist based in St Albans, uh, while Roland Williamson is a museum replica maker of 40 years standing. Between them, they've been researching talks since 2015. I always find talks is a really good word for Scrabble, particularly if you've got a Q, because you can spell it the other way. Their ongoing research project has involved a team of goldsmiths, silversmiths, and jewellers, and aims to understand the methods used to create Iron Age gold artifacts. So tonight, I'd like you to welcome uh, Dr. Tess Matchling and Roland Williamson talking talks, a craft perspective on Iron Age gold. You get me for the first bit. Um, and just to say, not only gold, but we also have chocolate, because that's made of chocolate too. So yes, tonight. I don't know how much any of you know about gold in Iron Age Britain, um, but basically, after the late Bronze Age, there's a hiatus in gold production. And it kind of disappears until around 300 BC when it starts appearing again in the archaeological record. And here we've got the Leek Frith chalk hoard here, which was found in Staffordshire in 2016. And the two Towton talks, which were found separately, I can't remember the exact date, but within about the last 10, 15 years. And what we're finding the whole time is Metal detecting finds, every single one that comes up changes the picture. So the Leek Frith hoard, when it came up, suddenly put gold working in this country back about 100 years. So this has taken it back to 300 BC-ish. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, Iron Age gold, apart from coins, it tends to be very restricted in form. We don't have brooches. We've got the occasional little bit used on various other things like the um, hemorrhoid spoons and things like that. Um, but mostly what we've got are talks like this, the Snettisham Grotesque talk, or the little Towton bracelets, which again are talks, but they're smaller ones. Um, Clevedon Terminal, I'll be talking about later. One or two rings, very, very simple ones. And then I think this is the only bracelet of this kind we've got from Snettisham, which was actually attached to the Great Talk when it was found. But the overwhelming majority, unless we're talking coins, are talks of what we will find. So we've got kind of complete ones, and we've got also lots of different broken up ones, and more and more broken ones are appearing um, through detected finds through PAS. So what is a talk? Well, the standard idea is it was worn on the neck, or obviously the smaller ones may have been worn on armlets. And of course, the classic is Boudicca wearing her gold necklace. Now, whether this was a talk or not, we don't know. We've also got, quite interestingly, on things like the Gundestrup and on coins and various other things, of people actually holding talks. So the little Wimpole figure that was found by Cotswold Archaeology, how was it this year or last year? COVID, I've kind of lost time. But yes, we're seeing a lot of people holding talks as well. And what's interesting, I'm hoping this video will work. Can you hear? Isn't that wonderful? Now, these are Spanish talks. Each one has a slightly different sound. And when we x ray them, you can actually see inside there's a little pellet. It's not an accident. They've actually put a little pellet of metal inside. So, is that potentially what we're looking at with these things being held? Don't know. We haven't so far got any evidence of any hollow talks in this country that have something in, although I'm starting to wonder again when the Snettisham Great Talk was found, 
it apparently had a coin inside the terminal or inside the wires, inside the coils, which was dismissed as it had been put in there, it, it got in there through deposition. But I'm now starting to wonder about that, whether that was the case. Now, torques come in many different shapes and sizes, as you can see here. I mean, the classic is this kind of top right, the Newark. That's what everyone thinks of as a torque. But we have various different terminals, buffer terminals here, which, you know, train buffer. We've got rings. We've got these kind of trumpets. We've got all kinds of things. We've also got the tubular torques here, cage torques, lots and lots of different forms. Um, most of these here are from Snettersham. This is from the Leakfrith Horde and the Newark Talk here. But I think all the rest of them are from Snettersham. Yes, they are. So for us, it all started with Newark. Um, now, up until 2015, I'd never thought about talks in my life. My PhD is on 17th century Caribbean fortifications. And I was chatting to Roland one day, who's a replica maker. And the Newark talk, which had been found by a detectorist in 2005, in 2015, thanks to a lottery grant, was going to go home from the British Museum to Newark to a newly designed museum. And Roland had spotted this, and he was really interested because he'd actually made a copy of something called the Southwest Norfolk talk for Norwich Museum a few years previous, and had happened to be in the British Museum when the Newark talk was there and the Sedgeford talk. And he wasn't entirely convinced by what everyone, how everyone said these things were made. Because as a replica maker, he had concerns that it wouldn't have actually quite worked. So in 2015, this is poor old Glyn Hughes on the left, who's the curator at Newark Museum, and he's lovely. We went and saw Glyn, and we said, we think they're made a different way. And at that point, we didn't have chocolate props or bits of gold or anything else. So a banana and a satsuma it was. So yes, Glyn, first meeting, I think he thought, what on earth am I getting myself into with these two? Now, the established view about talks, as you can see here, and this is still maintaining, um, it has to be said, is that these talks are all cast, including this is the great talk here. And that they're actually cast on to the wires. So this is where I get my props. So the kind of prevailing opinion was that you'd cast your torque terminal separate. Well, you'd, you'd have your wires here. And then you'd make your clay-covered wax model. You would burn the wax out so you had a hollow shape. Put it onto the wires and then fill it with gold. The problem with that is if anything goes wrong with this, you're destroying. And on the great talk, as we can see here at the bottom, you've actually got 64 handmade wires there. If this gold leaks onto here, you've ruined it. So our initial supposition was that actually these were made separately and then attached onto them. Ah, is that, is that working like that? So yes, you've got 64 wires here, so that would have been cast separately. Well, we think they were cast separately to start off with. The prevailing view was that they were cast directly onto these wires, but this seemed incredibly risky. So what we wanted to do was to actually start testing the evidence, because when we did a literature search, although everyone said that they were made by casting onto the wires, we couldn't actually find any evidence to show that they were made casting onto the wires. So Roland got on the internet and literally Googled talks and came up with the Netherer terminal, um, which is the one I've got here that you can see on the screen or in chocolate in real life. Didn't expect to ever say that. Um, but the beauty about this one, obviously, it's not attached. So we could have a look inside. Whereas with Newark, the great talk, the grotesque talk, all the terminals are attached, so it's very difficult to see what's going on. Now, this was actually found in 1806 um, in, as part of a hoard with 40 coins, um, the globule a la croix, very basic kind of smarty-shaped coins, elongated smarty. Um, and three other talks, two that were armlets and a third one. 
And as so often happened in the early 19th century, they gave the rest of it to a goldsmith in Edinburgh and it was never seen again. So all we have now is one talk terminal and two coins, which you can see on display in the National Museum of Scotland. Now, the beauty of this one, as I say, we could have a look inside. So there's Roland there with Fraser Hunter up at the NMS. And what we could see when we looked is that you've got all of the relief, all of this relief on the front. We can actually see on the interior in obverse, as it would say. Now, if this was cast, you wouldn't be expecting to see this. You would be expecting to see a very flat surface on the inside. We've also got these kind of seams which suggest metal's been joined. There's one here. We've also got these little hammer marks all over the inside. And it's also very thin. It's only about 0.7 millimeters thick, which any of you who know about casting, it's just impossible. So this was, this was not cast. And then when we had a closer look on the outside as well, you could see various elements that were tracking the seams on the inside. And what we managed to work out is we've actually got a three-part um, talk terminal going on. So you've got this torus shell, the donut, and inserted into the center of that is this apple core shape here to close off the kind of donut, as it were. And then once all that was closed off, the collar was added. And it was also categorically very, very clear that this was made of sheet gold. This was not cast, which explained quite a lot because actually once it's sheet gold, it becomes much easier to make. And particularly using this tripartite way of putting it together, it's not as difficult as people think. I mean, if you're, if you're a skilled goldsmith, obviously, no way I could do it. I can do it in chocolate, no way in gold. And then we started thinking, okay, fine. So netherurge is gold sheet. What about the others? Now, the nether terminal is actually almost identical size within about a millimeter or so of the Snettisham Great Talk. And again, with the grotesque talk here, we've got the same kind of principle, something hollow, was it sheet, was it cast? When we were walking through room 50 at the British Museum, on the side of the Snettisham case, this is an x-ray of the grotesque talk. And you can quite clearly see when you get in close, we've got exactly the same thing going on. Taurus around the outside here with the core in the middle. And you can see these slightly whiter areas here. Now these are where we've actually got the overlap between the core and the torus. So we've got another sheet tool. Now what's interesting about this one is that obviously the style, if I go back, it's very, very different. It's kind of what's called the plastic art style, which is supposed to be earlier than this style, which is supposed to be much later. But what we have got, and what you'd never guess if you were just looking at them, is we've got the same technology, the same way of making, going potentially for 200, 250 years. And we then asked the British Museum to x-ray the Snettisham Great Talk. Um, and they were still very much convinced it would be cast. Um, but when it was x-rayed, it is sheet. So we've managed to prove that a lot of these tourist talks are not actually cast. They're not even cast separately and then attached. They're sheet gold work. And we were also looking a lot at the surface of the talks to see what we could see there. Um, and you can see we've got the Great Talk, the Newark Talk, and this is a close-up of Netherurd. And we've actually got hammering all over the place, all over these talks. Now, if they were cast, it would be very hard. It's a valley, kind of like this, a, a V-shape for those on Zoom, um, to actually get hammers within that valley, and they were managing to. But of course, if you've got a two-part, this was attached after this, that's not a problem. We were also seeing that there were lots of dents and holes, again, that suggests you've got very thin gold, which again suggests you've got sheet work. And we were also seeing, as you can see here, these stress kind of overworking cracks 
where they haven't been annealing the gold probably quite... Annealing is when you heat it up and cool it down and it makes the gold soft to work, very simply. Um, and they obviously weren't doing it enough because they've got the gold starting to crack. Now, this is where it really got fun that we started looking at the decoration. Um, now, in, if you look on books in Celtic and in inverted commas art, Le Ten art, you will see lots about basket work, matting, tooling, I forget what all the other different words for it, but it's basically just dismissed as this thing that they use to fill up shapes in um, various bits of Celtic art and inverted commas. But when you get very close, you can actually see that it's not quite as random or as ordered as you think it is. So something like the Great Talk, we have this incredibly ordered kind of one, two, three, one, two, three, parallel blocks, um, perpendicular blocks going across. We see the same in Sedgefoot. But when you look at Newark and Leatherard, they're totally different. It appears at first to be random, all these little splodges. And these are only less than a millimeter wide um, the punch is about 0.7 mil. But when you actually start looking closely, you can see the same patterns occurring, two and two, two and two, two and three. And then these funny, almost like a little man, <laughs> little body and legs and arms. And this is Netherard, and this is Newark. And this is Netherard, and this is Newark. And again, twos and threes, twos and threes. We were starting to see these apparently random patterns time and time again but only on two of the talks, on Newark and Netherard, not on the Great Talk, not on Sedgford, not on anything else. And we also looked at the roundels, which are these little kind of decorated areas on the terminals. And as you can see here, we've got Newark on the top before there, Netherard on the bottom. Now, there's a number of similarities with this. They are all tooled anti-clockwise. When you arrange them like this, the slightly larger... Um, and the word has left me for the moment. False. Anyway, the bobbly bit. There is a word for it. Dummy rivet. The larger one is always in this position. And when you look at the decoration, we have three strokes in on the left. And then two strokes down, two strokes across. And we are seeing that in both Newark and Netherard. So when you get up close, you can see this similarity of pattern. Now, these are scaled at the same size. But when you look at Sedgeford, say, the dummy rivets are different sizes. This is all different. These are actually, I think it's 17 strokes on Netherhead, little punches, and 19 on Newark. So they're following, it's, it's the same hand, basically. And what we also found was when we looked on Newark, there was one of these roundels, D, down here, which was distinctly grottier than the rest. Now, it's less than 10 millimetres big, so unless you're looking closely, you can't actually tell the difference. Um, but what we think is going on is this may be an apprentice who's kind of watched what's going on, and then they said, go on, you have a go at this one. And then they've kind of very tentatively, because the strokes aren't as confident, several of the strokes have been overdone. It's either that or it's a Friday afternoon, want to get home for work early, so we shall see. We also started looking at the decoration. So Newark is actually about a centimetre and a half smaller than Netherard. But when you blow them up, you halve them and blow them up to the same size, as you can see, the kind of layout and proportion of decoration is very similar. We've got the swag at the bottom here, identical. This feature coming up to the centre of the face is in exactly the same place as it is on Netherard. You've also got this sweep coming down on both of them. This actually transfers on Netherard as well. Somebody has looked at these, and even though they're producing them in different sizes, they are doing the same. They like a certain layout, so they're doing it this way. And if you compare this, I haven't got time to go into the other ones, but anyway, it's very, very different, again, from what's happening with Sedgeford and the Great Talk. We had to make Netherard into a proper talk, so here we go, this is me photoshopping it to make it look a bit more like the great talk because it gets ignored because it's only a terminal. But what we're basically seeing is that Netherard up in Scotland and Newark down in Nottinghamshire are either made or finished by the same hand. Now this suggests we're looking at potentially 30 years date between the two of these, even though they are stylistically 
if you look at them there, you think actually they're quite different. Once you actually start taking them apart, they are very similar. And what we found recently, which is really exciting, is there's one from Snettisham as well. Now, we haven't, because of COVID, we haven't been able to go and have a look at this one, so it's a very blown-up photo, so we may, may be wrong. It's a very blown-up photo that we have from Norwich Museum. But as you can see, the little man is back. One, two, three, four, five, there he is. And we've got three strokes and two strokes here. And again, it's got the same feel to it, the, the buttons. You, we don't talk about feel and perception. It's something that artists and craftspeople use a lot. And you definitely, when you've seen a lot of these, you definitely get a feel for something. You, it, just, it just jumps out at you. So this is likely to be a third one. Now, back to the casting on theory. Yes. There are some talks that are cast on, but all of Roland's panics about what would happen if you started trying to cast a terminal onto the wires were happening. So here we've actually got a hole in the centre. This is called a cold shut where the gold hasn't gone properly into the mould. We've got bubbles, we've got wires sticking through, we've got here run down and ruined all your wires and there's a couple of wires poking through there. Holes here. This poor thing from Hengisbury Head has got a hole in the back. And North Creek, poor North Creek, the less said about North Creek, the better. Um, yes, it's very sad and very poorly done. So although they are casting on, they're not doing it very well at all. We also found evidence of separate casts. Now, this is Newark. Now, Newark, we originally, because it had every single characteristic of a sheet talk, we thought it was sheet. We'd x-rayed it with not quite a powerful x-ray, because gold is actually denser than lead, so you need a ridiculously powerful x-ray to actually be able to x-ray it. When we x-rayed Newark with a 450 kV, we suddenly discovered, when I was talking earlier about the flat inside, <laughs> this is actually cast, which is a bit of a, oh! But what is really interesting is it's not entirely cast. Because in the centre, they've left a polo-shaped hole, as it were, that they filled with a hammered polo-shaped piece of gold. Now, the reason we think they've probably done that is because they were, these guys are the better, they know what they're doing, and they've realised if they try and cast it in one go, they're going to get it cracking. So they've worked out a method that means they can cast the main torus, but with a gap in the middle, again, the kind of sheet technology, apple core type thing that will allow the mould to expand, the gold to expand and contract a bit and not crack. And we know this one was added, the terminal was added to the neck ring later because here we've actually got the gold wires and they've been cut off beautifully before the collar was attached. And what's really interesting, this is the collar here, and this here, and they have actually, they appear to have almost screwed the wire neck ring in. There's minimal solder there at all. Um, it looks as if it's mainly a manual fit. Sedgeford, hmm, when we were talking about what happens if you try and cast them and they crack, that's what's happened to Sedgeford. Both terminals, you can see on the back here, there's a big casting crack and they've had to put these rivets in to stabilize the crack, but they're almost invisible on the front. You can barely see them. They did a very, very good job of covering them up. But this, again, is separately cast and then added on. There's actually a slight gap here where the terminal has gone onto the wires. So what does all this mean? This is what Roll and I spent a lot of time looking at. Hmm. Now, the way we're starting to think if you start looking at British gold sources here, that starts tracking with where we've got these beautiful sheet talks. Now, this line, it, I should have actually put this in as a very dotted line because it probably Essendon's on the other side of it, but something going on like this. And to this side of it, we've got a tradition of sheet talks, and to the southeast of it, we've potentially got a tradition of cast. And what we think is happening is that these sheet talks, the great talk, the grotesque, are being copied in cast within possibly somewhere in the southeast. 
But of course, they are incredibly difficult to copy because they should be made of sheet. So they are having all of these problems, cracks, overruns, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, the other possibility about this is, are we looking at generally not coins or coins? So those to the northwest of the line are, I don't know what the right word, um, finding their status, meaning, or whatever in talks, beautiful handmade gold talks. Whereas to the southeast of the line, they've kind of thrown their lot in and they've gone with coins. Not sure yet, that's the next thing to look at. So yes, as I say, this general picture is that we've got things northwest, very, very good quality, possibly linking up with bronze because the bronze sheet, Northover noted that a lot of the bronze sheet work is the same thickness, 0.7 millimeters as a lot of the gold sheet work. So are they learning their tradition from bronze or are they working bronze and gold sheet? And then in the south where they're really, obviously they haven't got gold, they haven't got a tradition of working gold. What they do have is a tradition of casting, so they're trying to do it and it's not working. And then we come to Snettisham, because Snettisham throws everything out. Because you've got at least 250 to 300 talks represented, 300 years worth of material deposited in a very, very quick period, I'll come on to this in a bit. Whereas if you take Snettisham out, you start to see what the normal pattern for this country is, or these islands are. And generally, you're looking at three to four talks in a deposit, and that seems to be quite standard. Now, what is going on in Snettisham? Who knows? The book, the British Museum are writing the book, and it'll be out next year, and hopefully we will find out then. My feeling is it's some kind of final act of the Iron Age that they've come together to deposit all of these talks for some reason. Yeah, some reason. Who knows? But we should see. So why are they using sheet gold? Well, the most obvious one, if you look at the tubular talks and compare them to the Snettisham Great Talk, now the tubular talks are made from gold that's 0.1 millimetre thick. These two talks, similar diameter, one is 110 grams, the other one is over 1,000. So for 10 of those, you get one of them. So that may be the most basic reason. And if you're looking up close, they're going to look visually very, very similar. If you've never, in fact, even maybe if you've hold them, because the tubular talks have quite often an iron supporting core with sand. And so they may even have weighed as much as had they been solid gold. So that's a potential reason. And then sheets from the absolute extreme of sheet work in gold, which is the tubular talks, we get the great talk and the Ipswich talk. Again, very, very similar diameter, but obviously the great talk has much larger terminals, thicker neck ring, and yet they're both the same weight. So by using air effectively, adding it within the torus, adding it within the spring of the neck ring, because the neck ring is hollow, you are creating something that looks far more impressive, far larger than you are perhaps with this one, but you're using exactly the same amount of gold. So the work we do, we've got a wonderful team of people that we consult. Um, Roll obviously is a replica maker, so he's got a lot of hands-on experience. Michael Lloyd here in the centre at the top actually made the sceptre for the Scottish Parliament, so he's very experienced in working with native Scottish gold. Graham Taylor, who many of you will know as a potter, actually trained as a silversmith. Um, but we've got all sorts of people. Hamish Bowie, who's absolutely lovely, is totally respected. He started out in Birmingham in the Birmingham um, gold sector years and years ago. Ford Hallam, who's trained in Japanese metalworking. Anne-Marie Carey, who works at the Birmingham School of Jewellery, and she was involved with replicating um, the Staffordshire Hoard. Sally Pointer and Blessing the late Gareth, her husband, they are also advisors. We've got a really nice team of people. And what you start seeing when you're working with these incredibly talented people is they look at things differently. So if you read the standard write-ups, at Snettisham, these kind of strange 
strung objects are found. And the current perceived wisdom is they are some kind of symbolic gathering together of dissected material, and that perhaps the rest of the talks were melted down for coins or whatever, possibly family groups, this kind of thing representing that. Anyway, we showed it to Bob Smith, <laughs> Bob Davis, who we work with. And Bob said, oh, I've got one of those in my wire drawer. I said, what? And he said, yeah, he said, every time I make a different sort of wire, he said, I'll keep a bit of it, or I've gathered up various other bits. And as you can see here, he's got different pieces of wire as an aid memoir. So are we looking at family groupings, or are we looking at something very practical like wire swatches? There's also a possibility we're looking at alloy groupings, because you usually have silver, gold, in various different proportions. So this could be ready for smelting, that it's an easy kind of, this is my alloy for making, I don't know, a torque or whatever. Weighed it all out, there we go. Particularly if you're traveling, things like this, it would make it very portable. We're not saying that any of this is right, we're just saying a craft perspective can give you another view that maybe you haven't thought about. This is another one. This is what we've called Heinz 57 <laughs> because it sat on the um, Norwich Castle display board with number 57 and all of our talks have got nicknames. But, um, so this one is actually currently listed as the British Museum as being a thin casting, which we weren't too sure about. And when you compare it to the Sedgford Terminal, similar dimensions, 22 grams versus 117 grams. This is not cast. There's no way. Sure enough, when we got to have a look at it up close, you can see here that although this one is different, it's actually made kind of using a clam two halves stuck together with the seam around the middle rather than the three part. The collar is added after. And again, we've got this, the kind of indents on the inside and the seams here where the two sheets have been put together. And the next task, this is all a bit, here we go. The grotesque talk. Everyone has assumed that these repairs are intentionally made badly to kind of show the age of the talk, that you are building up repair after repair, that's showing its longevity and blah, blah, blah. But the problem that we had is that actually, if you look down at the bottom left here, Iron Age people were quite capable and really wanted to carry out repairs that are not visible. So the Tor's pony cap, they've made this beautiful little shaped sheet and decorated it to go over a crack. As I said before, the Sedgford talk, they've put these rivets in to stop the crack growing that you can't see on the front. And even on the chiseled and cauldrons, which could be seen to be a bit more functional, they've actually scalloped the edges. And again, use metalworking techniques, solder, cutting out, all kinds of other things. None of that is visible on the grotesque talk. And as you can see here, as we'll show you a bit later, I've actually brought some gold along to show people. Had this been annealed so the gold was soft, that would wrap beautifully around. They haven't annealed it. In fact, there is no evidence of any kind of metalworking going on at all with these repairs. You or I could have literally done it. So where did these materials come from? Well, if you look at other hoards at Snettersham, we can find parallels for, these are completely separate, these ones here. They're not these taken off. We've got half a torque here, which we've got half a torque threaded through here. We've got square cross-section twisted wire, which we can see all around here holding on. We've got a piece of tubular torque, similar to this one that's held on the back, and pieces of flat silver wire, similar to these. The other problem that we've got is that you actually look at the cataloging number for the grotesque torque. There's these pieces of silver wire that are spare. Now, having looked at the actual excavation shots, these five I can actually add back in. They've just fallen off as it was excavated. But this one wasn't. So it looks as if this piece of wire was put into the ground with this torque. Now, this suggests that actually the repairs were done very soon or even at the time of this torque's deposition to perhaps turn it into a complete torque for burial. And when you start looking at the Snettersham hoards, these are all of them, all 14 of them, 
A to P. We find the red circles are repair materials, sources of re repair materials. And they're being used, including even on their great talk here, where a piece of this has got some gold flatter on it. If you want to know more about this, have a look at our website. There's a paper on there that explains it all. But the bottom line is it looks as if each of these six hordes all went into the ground at around the si same time because we can start linking material that's been used to repair in others with various other hordes. This is the really exciting one. This is where we start causing all manner of trouble. Um, this little terminal, the Cleveland terminal, you can see its face here from the side, has, as MacDonald says, faith in the chronological significance of the stylistic sequence has long been undermined by pieces like the Cleveden talk. And because it's decorated with palmettes, which are thought to be fourth century on the side, um, first, uh, stage one and two palmettes, which are thought to be fourth century on the side, but with a stage five triskela on the face, there's been an argument that the art styles have continued through to the late Iron Age. But what if the terminal isn't actually all one thing? So if we look at our Taurus terminal again, if you cut it down and then you turn it over and put a lid on it, you have the Clevedon terminal. And when you actually compare it to Netherard, so this bit here, the collar, as you can see, it steps up at the front, it does both on Netherard and the Great Talk, and the dimensions are very, very similar for the whole thing. And when we look inside, where we would expect to have a Colosseum here from where it's been cut down, we have a Colosseum. And we also have this very frilled edge, which would suggest they've got too much material going on. And of course, had that come from here, they've had to kind of clamp it in to work. So we would actually suggest that these palm mats may actually be 4th century, and the original talk may actually be 4th century and has then been adapted later on. But as I say, without looking at the technology, everyone was just looking at the art and explaining the talk from the art. We've also found a new gold working technique, which is rather exciting. So when you look inside talks, the ones that we can, this is the Clevedon talk, Netherard, and this is the near stone market talk, which actually was found by a detectorist in 1996. But because it was just prior to the Treasure Act, the British Museum looked at it and then gave it back to the finder. Julia Farley at the British Museum found a record for it and said there was this talk, so we went off on a hunt. And thanks to everyone in Norfolk and Suffolk, we found the finder who miraculously hadn't actually got rid of it. So we've now written that up. Um, but anyway, going back to the bean. As you can see on the inside here, this is very mottled. It's not very clean. And if you look at Repousse, so one of the Bronze Age um, gorgettes from Ireland or the Battersea Shield, if you look, so we've got front here and back. If you look at the back, it's very, very clean, very precise, because all the working is going on from the back of the object. And on the front, you're seeing the raised design coming through. When we showed this to Ford Hallam, who's a traditional Japanese metal worker, he said, oh yeah, it's been worked from the front. What? So he then sent us these. And basically, apart from dishing out your piece of gold here, you fill it with pitch or tar, you turn it over, and then everything you do is from the front side. So all of this gold working you can see here, no repousse whatsoever, it's all moving gold around from the outside surface. The other really interesting thing is if you look at the tools he uses, wood, antler, tiny hammer, none of this we'd find apart from maybe that little head. And when you look on the inside of a piece of gold that's been worked using the Uchidashi technique, it has this very typical orange peel texture, as they call it, and that's exactly what we're seeing on the inside of Clevedon, on the inside of Netherard and on the inside of the um, Stamarket talk. 
Now, we don't know whether we're seeing that on the inside of the great talk or the grotesque talk, because obviously we can't see in. Another thing that everyone said was, oh, you can't make, the nether terminal has these beautiful concentric circles. And it was kind of academic knowledge that this couldn't be made in any other way than casting. So I happened to mention this to Ford. Um, and I then got a message a little bit later saying, I'm going to have a play. I'm just nipping down the pub for a pint, and then I'm going to have a play. I'll, I'll give you a ring in a bit. And then I received this series of messages, five text message over the next two hours. So we've got pitch in the background here, and Hall Ford has made himself this kind of little dome bowl of silver. He's then marked it out. Using Uchidashi, he's then done the concentric circles. He then got carried away and started doing leaves, more leaves. And there we go. And he did all of that in 90 minutes. This was actually from an ingot within the 90 minutes as well. So he's hammered out the sheet, everything. And when we look at it, it's absolutely identical on the exterior. And more interestingly, when you look on the interior, we've got exactly the same things going on, these very kind of blurred shapes. So from that, I hope I've given you a sense of how important it is to actually talk to craftspeople because we can sit and talk about art history, we can sit and talk about pictures, patterns, how this compares with whatever, but until you show it to a craftsperson who's used to working the material you're looking at, you won't really get the answers that you need. And now I'm going to hand over to Roland, and you've got a nice video in. Right, so we've got some video footage here of um, me doing some simple work on 24 karat gold, which um, I think at the time was about 400 pounds worth of gold for a few grams. Um, and I've done many things working on many, many, many materials, organics as well. And I've got a little bit here. Again, we're going to show you, uh, so they'd hand these around so you can have a look at some of these and see what kind of marks have, have resulted uh, with these things. Um, but this is all demonstrates the control in making these talks. These things were super valuable in their day, and they're super valuable now. And the thing with casting at the end of the day is it's very messy. You end up filing things away. And uh, you can imagine in an Iron Age workshop, they're trying to you know, pick up bits of filings off a of bare floor is always going to be quite difficult. Hence why you go to sheet, because it's very controlled. And this is just some basic working of that right from the beginning. And I'll just go through it. You can, and it's the sounds as much as anything of the workshop. So quite simple tools, nothing terribly elaborate. Um, <laughs> all done on the kitchen sink, you might note. Now that's my particular setup, is my anvil and a stake on top of there. And there we have the uh, little pellet that we've hammered a few times and then melted down again as you can see, into a rather crude little uh, fashion shape, and one thing or another going on. So, here we are. This is a, a, part of the annealing process. Help soften And although it's gas, with it being so small, I shouldn't think that even with uh, a child and a set of fellows and some charcoal, it's not going to take very long to get that up to an appropriate temperature to anneal the gold and to soften it up again. We'll, again, we'll demonstrate this a little bit later with you where you can actually handle it. See the tap running in the background? <laughs> Sadly, not a very satisfying um, hiss with the steam. But ultimately, and now this is all done uh, at, you know, the roughly, apart from me just wandering over, you know, this is, this is the speed it occurs at as well. And you see how it is, easy it is to actually just to unveil it. I think that's about two mil thick, something of that order. There are other little things which you will, you will never capture on film, but you do notice when you're physically doing it. 
is that the tiniest, tiniest flakes of gold come off and land around the work. And in fact, Tess's kitchen table for a while had little tiny speckles, you know, of probably a, a quarter of a penny's worth of gold scattered around, stuck to the varnish. So all the time, it's actually losing worth in, in a way. But it's really satisfying. You know, working bronze wire is kind of nice. Silver is nicer, but gold is just works in such a almost soothing way. There we are. And that was out of the one piece of gold, wasn't it, that we stretched out there. And I've never made wire before, but it doesn't take very long. This is very much on the back of the piece that Time Team did for special extension. Um, where they went to workshop and worked admittedly in silver. They took a billet of silver and then started to, for the sake of the TV, begin to work it out into a wire. And it's true, it takes skill. But gold, in many ways, just moves so much more satisfying than I should imagine even a child. Uh, in fact, many children were doing this sort of thing, learning the skills by handling the material being a very, very repetitive process. So that's £400 worth going up in smoke, sort of. It's captivating, I have to say. It, the camera doesn't really quite... Um, it, it's, you know, it's... There's a glossiness going on there, which the camera can't quite uh, see, unlike the human eye. Um, it's beautiful. Sometimes they actually drip uh, gold to help flake it into uh, cold water at this stage to get rid of any bits of min other minerals in it during the processing. Um, but obviously, with this being such a high carrot, it, 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 there's no need to do anything quite like that. And it scares the bejesus out if you've never done it before, just pouring white hot gold into cold water. You can just begin to see that sort of that sheen that, that, that uh, is coming onto it. The thing I don't want to do, obviously, is put it in too hot. Come on, cool down. You could blow on it, I suppose, if you wanted. I'm feeling brave enough now to put it into the water. There we are. As you can see, it's pretty uninvolved, isn't it? Uh, if this was a piece of silver, Ideally, you'd need to then uh, quench it with an acid in there to remove any of the scale built up through heating it. The gold, uh, with a very high carrot, I might add, you can go straight back to the anvil. And using a slightly heavier hammer here, the other thing is to note that how polished everything is. All the work surfaces, very clean, flat. Because as you're working, the last thing you want to be doing is injecting damage into the surface so the hammerhead is polished as well. You don't just pick that hammer up and utilize it for hammering nails in or making bits of go-kart and things like that. It's very much a, for a very specific purpose. So I'm trying to work it down here down to about, I think, did we go down to a millimeter or half a millimeter. It has to be annealed at now and again. Um, otherwise, you're going to induce that cracking that you could see in the terminals of some of the other torques, um, which, to be honest, you only ever see them when they're under ma great magnification. But it is beginning to break down. They're pushing the metal just a little too far. You can see how stiff that has become as a result. Amazingly tough this point.
back to the old um, gas torch. And now that it's flat, big surface area, um, it should uh, come up to temperature quite, quite satisfactorily, quite quickly. And it is kind of absurd that we can do it on the uh, kitchen sink. It would kind of suggest how small a workshop could be. You know, you could have these things within a yard or two of you. So the likelihood of actually excavating a site where you could, you know, confidently say, this is a workshop, you know, that could be a small portion of any one Iron Age house. A very small portion indeed. Um, and you often see this whole thing of pirates um, supposedly biting and bending coins. I can tell you, you're just going to smash your teeth trying to do that. So I recommend you don't, is the first thing. And in fact, there are some pieces of talk, scrap, that look for all the world like they've been bitten. They've got dentition in them. Um, and uh, we made test do it with some annealed. Only, I think it was a half a millimeter. Yeah. And that was tough going, but it really does happen. Somebody in desperation was biting it shut at the time. Or to you know, dis partly distort, uh, destroy it, distort it. Now, if you give a, a, a hunt about on the internet, on uh, dear old YouTube, uh, uh, you can find a uh, Pathé uh, piece, Pathé news piece, about gold leaf makers in the late 50s. And there was an industry in, I think it was Hounslow, if I'm not mistaken, where they had teams of people making just gold leaf. And it starts out from billets like this. And it is just amazing how far you can drive gold and keep moving it, moving it, and it's still structurally sound to keep it uh, fashioning things. Um, the classic that we've got is the mold cake is made from a piece of gold the size of a golf ball. That just gives you an idea of how far that can be pushed and pushed and pushed. I think it's nominally, what, half a millimetre thick all the way through, something of that order. It's a bit more satisfying. Quickly back to the anvil. Oh, oh yeah, we're good. Yes, just keeping an eye on where we were going. We're just under a mill. And very compliant under your fingertips. I have to say, if you've ever got uh, a spare moment, one of the nicest things you can do is go to a jewelry course and make yourself a ring out of silver. It embodies some of these aspects of hammering and working things. That whole transformation of something um, quite mechanical into something that you personally have transformed, I thoroughly recommend you do it one day and spend some time or over a weekend. It's, it's initially it'll be terribly um, frustrating, but I'll tell you what, it is enormously uh, satisfying at the end of the day when you've made something. I mean, you, could, you probably, if you really want to astonish the uh, jewelry, um, the chap who's going to be uh, guiding you, is you could always turn up with your own few grams of gold, I suppose. Um, or if you've got some gold that you hate at home, perhaps they'll be brave enough to transform it to something that you can be feel proud of. Um, bring that down to half. As you see, again, look at that, the stiffness that's still embodied within that. And you can imagine these torus torques, you know, all those curves, all of those elements of decoration in it, all the... They are, at the end of the day, just corrugations in, in the surface. They stiffen that to such an extent that it will survive being worn. Um, the ones which are, at the end of the day, most astonishing and, and least investigated, and certainly by ourselves, are the tubular torques that are only a tenth of a millimetre thick. 
when you pick them up, they feel of literally nothing. And that's gold. They feel like nothing. If you feel like you've picked up something made of bako foil um, and that it would just kind of crumble in your, your, your hands. But if you're brave enough and um, the curator's not looking too keenly, the slightest squeeze and you can feel it, that there's a rigidity to that. Um, and that patently is why it survives. You know, it has that stiffness despite it being, you know, 99% air. And it comes back to that thing about what are you doing, that you get that vast amount of bling for literally 10% of the metal that was invested in the Great Talk, or indeed what would have been in the uh, Nether Earth, for that matter. And as soon as you've lost that tubular section to it, um, like the Essendon, the remains of the Essendon, it just looks like it's been almost paper been torn up with the hands. Not that it really was, but it... it, it Kind of embodies that um, frailty once that tubulant um, cross section is lost. Somewhere I had to reset it, didn't I? In fact, I think, yeah. And it just keeps working and working and working. It's um, it's breathtaking. It really is. Um, and you can understand items like the lunar. Um, that have been found as well. But again, terribly, terribly thin. But actually, there is, you know, still uh, the rigidity left in it that um, uh, another craftsman, not necessarily the same person who hammered them out, could then draft the patterns on it and then engrave them subsequently. I think we're there, aren't we? And despite all of that hammering, it still has a fair amount of sheen left on it. It doesn't require, like a casting would, somebody coming along and removing the patterning uh, and, the, and the stippling that you get with the casting. The, the, you're building sheen all the time. The other aspect is, oddly enough, is that if it has any contamination with copper and things like that, you're raising the copper to the surface. And every time you do anneal it, and wash it out, you're removing some of the that copper salt, and it brightens the exterior. Now, I don't know that they were passing off, necessarily, but I think probably they all understood that as you worked it and, and did that sort of thing, gold always brightens. And the only way you can do that is this hammer work of sheets. Anyway, thank you ever so much for paying attention to that one. It was a bit, just <laughs> a bit mesmeric watching somebody hammering gently away. But... Um, as I say, I would recommend go and make yourself something out of some silver. Uh, and if you can afford it, go and make it out of gold. It is just a delicious thing to work. And it does give you a beautiful insight into what people's hands have always done over the millennia. Thank you ever so much.